Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Uh, welcome back. We are starting unit two today. As you can see by these lovely, colorful pictures here, we're going to be looking at tissues. So at this point, uh, you have probably already looked at tissues fairly extensively in your labs. Um, so some of the information that we'll be going over will be kind of quick because you have seen this. I will uh, reiterate some areas along the way, but um, yeah, let's kind of dive into it and get going from here. So, all right, here we are. If you remember our nice uh, human body hierarchy, uh, we are going to be up there in the tissue region today. So we've sort of made our way through atoms, molecules, organelles, and the cell. And now, I'll put up my laser pointer here, we are going to be looking at tissues. And we'll be talking about how these tissues play roles in our organs uh, and how they're interacting with those cell types. And don't forget about Quest. There he is. Hey, Quest. Nice to see you. That's a nice smile you have. Okay, so uh, you are responsible for knowing tissue name, tissue location, and function for all of the tissues that we go over in lecture and that you've gone over in lab. They're the same thing, so you should have a really good understanding of these. Again, we're really trying to bridge that gap between lab and lecture, and there's a lot of application as far as tissues. You're going to see all these tissues again in 202, so you really need to make sure that you get this stuff down, uh, and when you look at an image, you're able to, again, tell me what it is, what's the function, uh, and where do you find it. I made this diagram for you. Um, you probably have gotten an email about this by now, um, but this will be posted on VV Learn Shells. So make sure that you spend time practicing this, okay? Uh, this is basically a, a giant, I guess, organization of all of the tissues that we're learning in lecture and lab that you're gonna need to know. So, Let's kind of organize this and, and figure out where everything is. Really big grouping is our connective tissue. Our epithelial tissue is our second largest group. And uh, we're going to spend most of our time talking about connective tissue and epithelial tissues. Uh, you'll see a lot of those in labs. Then we're going to look over muscle and then nervous tissue. So unit three will go over nervous tissue. Unit five, uh, sorry, unit three and four will go over nervous tissue. Unit five will go over muscle tissue. Connective and epithelial tissue we're going to see weaved in uh, through the rest of the semester. And so you're going to need to have a good understanding of how to divide these up. So let's start with nervous tissue. It's the smallest. We're going to be looking at neurons. We're going to look at their functionality, how they send uh, signals and communicate with each other. We are going to be focused on skeletal muscle here in 201, uh, and we also will touch a little bit on smooth muscle, cardiac muscle you'll be looking at in 202 when you get into the circulatory system. Now, if we take epithelial tissue, we can divide it into simple or stratified, and we'll refresh your memories about how we do that. Hopefully those words are not uh, unfamiliar for you. But we have four types of simple, meaning one layer. Squamous, short and flat, cuboidal, cube-like, columnar, and pseudostratified. Then we have stratified squamous, or multi-layered, flat cells, and transitional. So we'll be looking at all of those today. If we come over to our connective tissue, this is where it gets a little bit confusing for people because uh, we have connective tissue proper. So connective tissue is this overarching uh, term and this type of tissue because it is connecting structures within our body. So we have proper connective tissue, we have cartilage, bone, and blood. Yeah, blood, even though it's liquid, it is considered uh, a tissue because it's made up of multiple cell types, all right? And so these are our four types of connective tissue that we're going to be looking at. If we start with proper connective tissue, we're going to subdivide that into two categories, loose connective tissue 
and dense connective tissue, and we'll see why we separate those. Within loose, we have areolar, we have adipose, and we have reticular tissue. Each of these, uh, of course, has their own function and their own appearance. Under dense connective tissue, we have regular dense connective tissue, irregular dense connective tissue, and elastic uh, connective tissue. All right. Then under cartilage, we have three types, hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. So I'm hoping you're filling in your chart as we're moving through this. And then there's two types of bone that we'll look over, compact and spongy. And again, blood for our purposes uh, in 201, we're talking about blood uh, moving hormones, moving substances throughout our bodies. You'll get into the nitty gritty in 202. What are the cellular components there? How do they function? How do they play a role in immunity? How does that work with our respiratory system? So again, a lot of terms. Organize this, practice this, write this out on whiteboards, make yourself flashcards, mix them all up and then try to put them in order. But uh, these are the tissues that you'll have to know for this unit. Now, in order to really understand these tissues, I, I like to go back to when we were just a glimmer in our parents' eyes, right? Where, when we were starting as a single cell of a zygote, all right? Now, I, I like to throw in a little bit of a, I guess if you will, science history here. Um, of where, does, where do these tissues come from and how do they get to where they are because I think that that helps us understand our current perspective and our current uh, organization of, of those tissues, okay? So if we start with a sperm and an egg coming together, um, basically the, the sperm need to make their way up the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, down these uterine tubes, where they eventually find an egg. The egg is leaving the ovary. It's being ovulated into this ampulla, into the uterine tubes, and that is where we see fertilization generally occurring. When those two cells meet, then they form a zygote. And what happens is now we kick in cellular division, right, through mitotic division. So that zygote is one cell, it splits into two cells. Those two cells each split into new cells, so now we have four cells. And each of those four cells split into new cells, and now we have eight cells, and then 16, and 32. And this rapid cellular division uh, happens over and over and over and over and over again. And at uh, 72 hours, eventually we have what's called a morula. All right, now the term you'll need to know, uh, you should be familiar with this term, morula. The other term you should know is a blastocyst. So after uh, a morula is formed, which is, think of it as like a, a solid ball of cells, all right? And so um, if you think of like a rubber ball, that's all rubber in there, all that would be cells. After that morula starts to divide, those, those cells start migrating and they actually start to hollow out. And that ball of cells becomes almost like a balloon of cells, where you have an outer layer um, made up of cells and a hollow inside. At six days, that blastocyst is gonna implant into this endometrial lining of the uterus right here. So you have this nice cushiony bed. Um, it's really cool, you'll learn all about it in uh, Female Reproductive of 202, and you'll learn about you know, all the hormonal control that goes on, pretty amazing process. But for us, for our point, our purposes, we have this blastocyst, which is this hollow ball of cells, and it has a little inner cell mass right here. And you can see this highlighted as this little bulge. And so this would be, a, a, you know, probably in here, a frontal cross section of this ball. Um, and so there would be another half that would fit onto that, okay? So those two terms I want you to know, morula and blastocyst. 
Now, if we talk about those cells, and maybe if you've taken 182, this might be a little bit more familiar for you, is what's happening to that blastocyst and that hollow ball of cells is that we start seeing these cells migrating into different, uh, into different parts of that cell. And we start to see an invagination of that outer uh, layer of cells and that migrates inwards. And what happens is those cells start to change and we can follow those cells into their end product. So what we see is we see the development of what's called germinal layers. Okay, and so we have three germinal layers, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And so you're gonna to need to know those terms. So in blue, we have our ectoderm out here. In red, we have our mesoderm. And in yellow, we have our endoderm. So the inner endo, the middle, meso, and the outer, the ecto. Now that little invagination uh, starts to migrate inwards, and eventually we get a second invagination over here, and that eventually will become the mouth. So our first invagination becomes our anus, uh, and our second invagination will eventually become our mouth, okay? Um, that then creates this tube which is our digestive uh, system, okay, and passes from the mouth to the anus. Now, when we look at those layers, what we can see is that the endoderm eventually will develop into things like our gut, our liver, and our lungs. The mesoderm will become tissues or structures, I should say, organs and structures like the skeleton, our muscles, our heart and our blood, while our ectoderm cells become our skin and our nervous system, so more superficial things, right? Where our endoderm tends to be more deep things in our bodies. So when we put these together, and right now we're gonna learn a bunch of different tissues, in a couple of lectures we're gonna talk about the integumentary system. And the integumentary system is our skin. After that, we're going to, for unit three and four, we're going to talk about our nervous system. So we're talking about cells and tissues and structures that have derived from these ectodermal layers when we were just developing embryonically. I think that's a really cool uh, perspective when you, when you think about where all of this comes from. You know, not only are you trying to memorize all these new words and, and understand how they all interact, but also knowing where they came from, I think helps gives, give us better meaning about all of these structures. When we get into unit five, we're gonna be learning about the skeleton, uh, the muscles and um, unit, uh, this unit will also talk about the skeleton. So again, making those connections, I think will, will help you understand this a little bit. So on a test, uh, I'll definitely ask you about these germinal layers. What's an endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm? Uh, what, what do they derive uh, into or what do they uh, develop into? So I might give you on a test, you know, the blank layer forms the gut, liver, and lungs. And so you would need to know that that's the endoderm. Um, or I might say uh, the skeletal system, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about bones. So I might ask you a question about bones and just say these have developed from which of the three germinal layers. So make sure you're, you're trying to build in those connections as you, as you move through your study. Now those cells, when they are first developing, we can call those cells stem cells. They're undifferentiated, meaning they don't have a certain function yet. Okay, they're just kind of a cell that is existing. They have the potential to differentiate, right? The potential to differentiate into a lot of different cells. So if you look at this image down here, we can see that blastocyst, that structure I was telling you to know, and we see that inner cell mass of cells. These are all stem cells. And that cell, we can take that cell out, and that cell can be uh, coerced into differentiating into any of these structures. Okay, so it has a lot of potential to be anything. Now, that cell, 
can divide to produce more of those cells. And what we'll see is there's a difference in stem cells. So we have embryonic stem cells and we have adult stem cells. The embryonic stem cells kind of come with all the uh, all the controversy, right, um, that, that's surrounded about where do we get those cells. So let's name some of these cells because I think, again, this is going to have a, a greater meaning. It's going to add greater meaning to our understanding of tissues and histology and these structures that we're going over. Now, there's a term. There's four terms we're going to look at. Uh, totipotent. Totipotent can, cells uh, can develop into anything, any of a fully differentiated human cell. Now, they come from that morula. So if you remember, at about 72 hours, all of those cells have been dividing, 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 and it's this ball of cells. Now, we could take any of those cells and basically make anything that we want. Now, if we look at our blastocyst over here, we can look a little bit closer at those inner mass of cells. Notice that they're blue in this image. The um, artist is trying to differentiate them uh, from other cells. And these inner, sorry, inner mass cells, pluripotent basically means the ability to become many things, where totipotent has the ability to become all things. So these cells can become any cell type um, in, the, in that developing embryo. They won't become uh, the placenta or an umbilical cord, right? So they can become anything within a fully formed body. Uh, and so you can see here this representation that you know these cells may be in the circulatory system or the nervous system or the immune system. But this is depending on all kinds of signaling that's going on in our body that, you know, if you take an uh, uh, developmental biology class, you'll learn all kinds of cool stuff about this. So we have totipotent, the ability to be anything, pluripotent, the ability to be many things. Totipotent comes from these morula cells and pluripotent comes from these inner mass cells. Now these are our embryonic stem cells, right? Before we were born. Adult stem cells then are undifferentiated cells that are in the tissues of adults. Okay, so a little bit different. So let's put uh, some meaning to that. Now, before you look at this diagram and say, oh my gosh, I gotta memorize this. You don't need to memorize this. This is here as a visual to help you understand the definition, okay? So don't freak out, do not memorize this. I mean, unless you're just feeling like you wanna memorize something, um, not that you don't have enough things to memorize, but you're more than welcome to memorize it, but I'm not going to ask you uh, questions about that. So multipotent is a term that's used to describe adult stem cells. Multipotent stem cells can develop into more than one cell type of the body. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Um, if we look at this term right here, multipotential hematopoietic stem cell. Now, to be fair, you will learn about this cell, okay? Multipotential hematopoietic stem cells, all right? Um, and so uh, if you look at this diagram, this cell right here can take one of two pathways. It can become this myeloid progenitor cell, or it can become a lymphoid progenitor cell. These myeloid progenitor cells can become all of these cells in their development, okay? The lymphoid progenitor cells can become all of these cells down here, which means that these multipotential hematopoietic stem cells can become any of these cells, okay? So multipotent, they have the ability to become many things. And so these are bone marrow cells, all right? And we'll be talking a little bit about bone marrow in our next unit. Now, if we look at another type, we can reference the myeloid progenitor cell or the lymphoid progenitor cell as oligopotent. So oligo means few. Now, 
the myeloid progenitor cells, like I said, can become all of these, but they cannot become any of these. Okay, so it's just a, a little bit of fine tuning our definition and our understanding. Same is true here, the lymphoid cells can become these, but not any of these, okay? Um, so it's you know, kind of like a, uh, an analogy, it's not the best analogy, but you know, when you're born, you can become anything, right? You have the, the ability to become anything, but you know, as you grow up, you have all kinds of life experiences and uh, things happen to you, and that kind of narrows down who you become in, in, the, in, the, in the world, right? Um, as you get through high school, you kind of come out of school and everyone tells you, you can be whatever you want. Um, but, you know, at that point, you've probably already figured out some things that you do and don't like. And then you go into college. And, you know, when you think about your career progression, honestly, you could just say, I'm going to be an anthropology major or history major or English major or a biomed student. Right? You can choose any of those. But as you progress through your academic careers and you've taken more classes geared towards your final degree, uh, the less likely you are to say, well, I chose a history degree and now I'm a senior and I need a couple of classes to graduate. I'm going to change my major to biomed and start all over, right? So um, you lose that, that, that vastness of options. And so you become much more specific, okay? And this is kind of what we're looking at when we talk about totipotent and pluripotent embryonic stem cells, A and B, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and then multipotent is a little more specific, oligopotent is a little more specific, and then finally, our last term is unipotent. Unipotent is very specific. This is like when you're going in to be a you know, master's or PhD student, you're like really honed in on some pretty specific stuff. Not that you don't study other things, but you are uh, really focusing in on, on some pretty serious things. So these unipotent stem cells, they have the most limited plasticity, okay? And, and so these stem cells, as you can see in this example, these stem cells are only going to eventually become bone cells. These stem cells will only become cartilage cells. These stem cells only uh, muscle cells. We'll see in the integumentary system we have stem cells that are in our stratum basale and those are only going to be keratinocytes. Okay, so um, we lose some of that diversity. Now, I mentioned this earlier, right, the stem cell controversy. So when we look at stem cells, they have been used for all kinds of treatment of diseases. We can sort of coax them into being certain types of cells. We can put those into damaged uh, tissues to try to help replace and fix uh, various diseases. Um, but it does come with a, you know, a little bit of controversy as to where are we getting those things, right? Now, um, adult stem cells, they have, uh, they're limited in what they can become, and they're a little bit harder to, to obtain, but as science has been progressing, we've found new and better ways to use them, and we've also been experimenting with ways to take cells that have already become differentiated and, like, sending them back in their life and making them undifferentiated so that we can then turn them into something else. So this field is really uh, interesting and I, I definitely recommend looking into that stuff. Okay, take a second, answer these questions, pause your video here, and we'll come back in a minute. All right, how'd it go? Uh, let's look, look over these really quick. These, again, these are uh, a couple of example test questions that you might see on an exam. The blank gives rise to the blank, and I hope you said the ectoderm gives rise to the nervous system and epidermis. And in question two, this primary germ layer is the middle layer called blank. Progenitor cells in this layer called lymphoid or myeloid have this type of potency. So uh, mesoderm and oligopotency, all right? Few, uh, they can become few cells. The mesenchymal uh, or sorry, the uh, hematopoietic stem cells would be multipotent. Again, pause here, practice these, and I'll see you in a second.
All right. Um, again, hopefully this is helping you practice your terminology. Again, memorize that. And then as we go through this, these uh, next handful of lectures, try to apply those terms anywhere that you, that you possibly can. Now I want you to pause the video again here and I want you to look at this diagram and I want you to just make some basic observations about what's going on here. All right, so remember, observations, not inferences, right? We're just making some observations. So what did we see? What did you see? Hopefully you looked at these layers of cells up here and you said, okay, well, they have a nucleus. They're kind of ovalish. Uh, they have some spots in there. Probably uh, we can make an inference and say, well, those are probably organelles. Um, there's a nucleus, so we know it's a cell. Down here, hopefully you noticed, well, there's still four cells, but they're bigger. And down here, Maybe you said, well, these are the same size as those cells, but there's a lot more, okay? Now, we want to put some terminology to these observations. So we're gonna talk about tissue growth. Tissue growth then is increasing the number of cells or those cells get bigger, right? Just as we know, um, as we replicate from a zygote to a human, to a, an adult human, We've had to increase the numbers of cells, um, and we also have cells get a little bit bigger you know, if we go into the gym and we're working out. Now, the top layer of cells were your normal cells. The middle layer is what's called hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is when we enlarge the pre-existing cells. So these cells that you're seeing here, these four cells, have gotten bigger. Um, and so you see this happen during muscle growth. Uh, so you're going to the gym, right? You get swole, right? You literally do get swole. Uh, your cells are getting swole. And so that's kind of where this, um, this term comes from. But, uh, and then uh, accumulating fat. So when they're adipocytes, they store fat and they store lipids. So those fat cells actually get larger when we store more and more fat. The other term you'll need to know is hyperplasia. So hyperplasia is when we have uh, tissue growth, but it's through cell multiplication rather than cells getting larger. So um, during breastfeeding, the gland cells replicate and make more and more gland cells. Or when we damage our skin, we need to regrow it. Um, or just as you're sitting there, your, your skin is sloughing off and new skin is coming up from the bottom. Now a neoplasia, neo is new, so new growth, uh, is the development of a tumor. Um, that can be benign, not bad, or malignant, bad, bad, or cancerous. So the main characteristic of that term though is that the tumor is abnormal and non-functional. So it's not acting like the tissue that it's growing in. So if it's, um, you know, uh, if it's in your skin, it's not acting like skin cells. If it's in your pancreas, it's not acting like pancreas cells. It's abnormal and it's not contributing to the overall functionality of that organ or that tissue. So we have hypertrophy, hyperplasia, and neoplasia. Okay, so uh, make sure you're gonna apply those to some situations down the road here. Now, tissues can change over time and they can change depending on the situation. So if we talk about differentiation, we're talking about our stem cells that are then becoming something else. So unspecialized tissues in those embryos becoming mature types. Um, so our mesenchyme will become muscle. Uh, we said bone cells, right? It's bone stem cells becoming bone, we said totipotent or pluripotent cells, you know, eventually becoming blood cells. Metaplasia, so we had hyperplasia, okay, so getting more cells. Neoplasia, new growth. Metaplasia is changing form. So if you think of metamorphosis, changing form, 
here, metaplasia is changing from one type of tissue <clears throat> into another type of tissue. So you can see this diagram over here. We have columnar epithelial tissue that over time could eventually change into squamous epithelial tissue. So two examples that I can think of as one example is if we talk, look at females prior to uh, puberty, the, the vagina is lined with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Okay, we're um, you know, one layer cube shaped cells. During and after puberty, um, the, the vagina then changes into stratified squamous. Well, when we think about the functionality of those tissues, what's going on? We have simple cuboidal, a thin layer that is generally used for absorption and secretion. In stratified squamous, we have multiple label layers that is there to resist abrasion and, um, and kind of protect. Um, and so after puberty, you know, genet or, uh, evolutionarily, females should be uh, uh, procreating and, and having intercourse. And so that tissue is going to protect the vagina um, if there's any kind of, of penetration. Uh, another example is in our respiratory system, we have pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar cells. And so they, are, uh, they have cilia to help catch uh, dust and particulates. They have goblet cells that are producing mucus to help trap the dust. The cilia are moving it up and away and back to the back of our throats. Well, long-term air pollution or long-term smoking damages those cilia. It damages that simple columnar uh, epithelial tissue. And eventually what happens is that tissue can change into stratified squamous again. It's trying to resist abrasion, uh, resist any of that harshness that's coming through there. And so it loses its functionality, which is sort of a positive feedback mechanism because now without those cilia and those goblet cells, more particulates are getting into your lungs, speeding up the degradation of those lungs. So uh, metaplasia is, is a term that you'll need to be familiar with. And it's not to be confused with metastasis or metastasize. This is the spread from an initial site to a secondary site. And this is generally used when we talk about tumors or neoplasms, right? So here we have this tumor cell and this tumor cell may have a little bit of detachment or a little bit of breakdown and it migrates into the circulatory system or maybe into our um, uh, lymphatic system and then it spreads throughout the body or ends up in another area where it migrates out of that vessel and takes hold and starts to grow in another place. When we talk about fixing tissue, damaged tissues can be fixed in two ways. The first is regeneration. So basically regeneration is the replacement of those damaged cells by the same type of cell. Okay, so you cut yourself, uh, you damage some kind of cell, the cells die on your skin is a great example. You have dead cells that are just sloughing off. Uh, we need to restore those cells. So we're restoring normal function. That's really important, restoring the normal function. The other way is fibrosis. Um, and you probably have marks on your bodies of fibrosis. Anywhere you've fallen and you know scraped your knee when you were a kid or you know cut yourself and you're like, oh man, check out my scar, look at this. Right? This is fibrotic, okay? this is a fibrotic replacement. So we're, we're, we're replacing those damaged cells, but we have this fibrous scar tissue that takes its place. It holds the organs together, it holds your skin together. Uh, it's great, it's super strong, but it doesn't restore the normal function. And obviously your skin is doing what it needs to do. And if you have you know, scars on your skin, it's still keeping things out, but those, that specific area doesn't have those uh, keratinocyte cells. And so it's not a totally normal function that's being restored, okay? Now, just to kind of show you what that looks like, uh, if we cut ourselves, Oh no, she cut herself cutting a, I don't know what that is. It kind of looks like a blob of green 
seaweed. So I'm not sure. Maybe it's old meat. That'd be gross. But anyways, you shouldn't be cutting old meat, lady. So she looks pretty, uh, pretty concerned about her finger. And remember, we talked about a positive feedback system in the last unit. So we cut that skin. There's little um, fibers that are sticking out and, and uh, platelets will get stuck to those and they release chemical messengers that sends out new platelets to that area. More chemicals are released. They send out more platelets and we clot up this, uh, this, this cut. We stop the bleeding. Great, we've shut it down, positive feedback. But man, we've cut all the way down here. So we need to fix this. So what's gonna happen when we have immune cells and macrophages and fibroblasts that are coming in here? So macrophages are trying to gobble everything up and clean up and look for bacteria or anything that got in and we have fibroblasts that are gonna start helping uh, put in new fibers. We're gonna have new blood capillary formation and we start to close that up. And you can see that you know this is very fibrotic in here. And then over time, uh, we have uh, some residual scar tissue and we have a little bit of this epidermal regrowth. We can shed some of that um, tissue here. So again, we're strengthening that and trying to hold that back. But again, in this little area, it loses some of that functionality. Now, another uh, sort of category uh, that we can, we can talk about is tissue degeneration and the loss of tissue. So pretty gross looking image here. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like on a long camping trip, my feet look like this, right? I mean, just haven't haven't showered, you've been walking, wearing the same socks, wearing the same clothes for a few days down in the Grand Canyon or something. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Probably smells the same too, but whew, showers feel good after a long camping trip. All right, now, atrophy is the shrinkage of a tissue, um, and so, or, or losing the cell size. So you may have experienced this if you broke a bone and you were put into a cast. Maybe you jumped off the swings when you were a kid and shattered your, you know, your um, uh, radius or your ulna and put it into a cast. Um, you don't use that for multiple weeks. They cut the cast off and your arm is suddenly smaller than the other side. And so this is atrophy, right? Normal aging also happens, right? Uh, so as we get older, just our bodies kind of shrink and shrivel and um, don't have that, that bulk. So, you know, all you guys that are, you know, gym heads and in there all the time, right? Enjoy it while it lasts, because down the road, it's gonna go away. Take lots of photos. All right, um, necrosis then. Necrosis is a term where we are referring to a loss of oxygen or some kind of trauma or toxin or an infection that kills that, that tissue. So gangrenous or an infarction, maybe you have a heart attack, you've blocked uh, blood flow to a certain area of your heart and that to those cells die, they need oxygen, they're starved of oxygen and they can't get rid of their toxins because there's no blood flow. So now they're, they're also you know, just kind of getting choked out by all the chemicals that are, they're not getting rid of. And the other term is apoptosis. Um, apoptosis, you've probably heard this term before in a biology class, but this is programmed cell death. So uh, all of our cells have this built-in suicide gene and we can turn these on if maybe uh, the cell is, is, is infected by a, by a bacteria or a virus, we can kill it. Uh, or if you know, we sometimes use this um, if it's just better for the cell to kind of get out of the way. Okay, so these will be coded to just kind of kill themselves. All right, more practice. Pause your video, digest this material a little bit, and then I'll see you back here in a minute. Welcome back. So let's move on with tissues, right? We, so we have come from a historical perspective of tissues. Where did they come from? How did you become you? And we classified some different tissues. We gave some terminology about how tissues grow, how they develop, how they die, how they change. Uh, so now we actually want to look at the tissues themselves, all right? So 
four types of tissues, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. We went over this at the beginning. Again, I cannot stress it enough. Practice that. Practice and practice and memorize and memorize and draw it out. Now before we begin, let's uh, talk about tissue membranes. Tissue membranes are membranes made of tissue um, and they help compartmentalize our bodies. If you remember from unit one, we talked about the different body cavities that exist. Uh, you can see this image in the bottom right of your screen. Probably my head is overlapping this a little bit. Sorry, actually I think it's over this way, right? Hey, don't punch my head. Okay. Uh, we have these membranes that surround uh, different cavities or regions. So our first type are connective tissue membranes. So they're made of connective tissue and inside they have what's called synovial fluid. So uh, you're going to learn about this in your articulations labs with um, looking at joints. So we have synovial membranes. They line a joint cavity and they actually produce the, the fluid, the viscous fluid that surrounds the bones. So as you move your elbows, your fingers, your knees, uh, there's a little bit of lubrication around the, the articulations or the connections between those bones. So we need to contain that, okay? Then we can look at epithelial membranes. So these are membranes that are made of epithelial tissue. So the first one you can see here are mucous membranes. So lining the digestive, respiratory, urinary, reproductive tract. So when I mentioned uh, the, the, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue that lines our respiratory passages and traps dust, it's producing mucus to help catch that, that dust and debris. Again, the digestive tract we talked a little bit about this uh, in Unit 1, where we saw, uh, uh, we saw the, the microvilli and the villi, and in the stomach we had hydrochloric acid. Uh, so we need to have some mucus that lines that tissue to help for mobility, but also to kind of um, uh, reduce uh, the, the digestion of, of our cells. Serous membranes and cutaneous membranes. Serous membranes we talked about in this example around our heart. So we had our visceral pericardium and our parietal pericardium. So our visceral pericardium is a refresher lined the organ, viscera, and the parietal pericardium lined that body wall. And inside we have serous fluid similar uh, to synovial fluid, right, in that it's creating a lubrication. So as that heart is beating, um, there's no friction or there's a reduced friction. Uh, we find those around our internal organs, around our heart, um, around our lungs. And then a cutaneous membrane, and this is why we're talking about this, covers our skin or covers a body surface, okay, or lines the inside of a body cavity. And so this is what we're talking about today. We're going to be looking at our integumentary system. Well, not today, but our next, uh, in, a, in a couple of lectures here, we're going to be looking at how that cutaneous membrane functions. So I wanted to give you a little bit of classification and categorization here. Oh, our good friends, junctions, they're back. Hello, tight junction and gap junction. We've seen you a couple times already. Remember, our tight junctions are generally, and we'll talk about polarity of cells, but these are our apical portions of our cells, and you, that should be familiar to you since you ha are now a skilled master at naming epithelial tissue. Remember, stratified squamous or stratified tissues are, are named for the apical cells. Um, and down here is our basement membrane, so this is, would be the basal portion of our cell. Now, generally we find those tight junctions towards the apical portion, and gap junctions we'll find on the lateral portions, right? Because again, uh, as we saw before, ions are going to pass through these connections, they're going to pass through these little portals and communicate with cells on either side. Then we have anchoring junctions. So there's three types. We already talked about desmosomes. Remember, we have our intermediate fibers. You remember intermediate fibers. We had actin, intermediate, and uh, microtubules. And so these are gonna help anchor those cells together. So we can see these on the uh, lateral portions of our cells. Uh, we have 
um, adherence a little bit different because look, we have actin filaments. And what's interesting about that is sometimes these adherins, if they have actin filaments integrated with them, can actually, remember contract an actin, tighten and pull uh, and, and sort of help with some cell mobility or, or, or kind of create a, a little belt action, kind of tighten around uh, those cells. And then last is our hemidesmosome. And remember, we have our basal, basement membrane down here. These hemidesmosomes are anchoring the basal portion of that cell to that basement membrane. The basement membrane is a non-cellular adhesive layer, kind of like a double-sided sticky tape, if you will, uh, holding those cells, the epithelial cells, to the underlying connective tissue below. Now, uh, just to show you another perspective on this, here we can see some epithelial tissue here, uh, our basal surface of that uh, epithelial tissue is down here in contact with our basement membrane. You definitely need to know the term basement membrane, but you'll see the term basal lamina in a little bit. I don't, I'm not worried that you know that one. Okay, so basement membrane is down here, and then below that we see connective tissue. Now, what is this basement membrane doing? It's, it's a guide. It's kind of like a railroad track for uh, helping cells migrate while they develop. And if we look at that, sometimes that basement membrane can get thick depending on uh, different types of diseases. And that can change the functionality of uh, the cells or the structure of that tissue. So one example is diabetes. Uh, that basement membrane in small blood vessels in the retina and the kidney, it gets thicker. And that's bad when we're talking about diffusion because the thicker an area is, the slower it's gonna take for diffusion of oxygen and nutrients and wastes to move across that. So that can be especially damaging uh, in those regions, which is why we need to know what's going on with the basement memory. Just a closer look at that basal lamina. Remember, I don't need you to know basal lamina, but the basal lamina is the top portion of the basement membrane, but I wanted to just highlight the functionality of those hemidesmosomes, really integrating with that basal lamina in here, okay, and really tightly adhering those epithelial cells so they don't pull away or separate. So take a minute, practice, digest, see you in a little bit. All right, folks, let's move on. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Uh, I just wanted to highlight question two. Your doctor tells you your father has benign prostatic hyperplasia. We didn't talk about benign prostatic hyperplasia, right? We didn't go over that disease, but the expectation uh, that I have for you all is that you can utilize the terminology we've gone over and apply it to a situation. So benign, we talked about benign and malignant. Benign is not bad, malignant is bad, right? Um, or is cancerous. Prostatic, uh, prostatic is our prostate gland, right? So we can uh, say, all right, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So hyperplasia is the increase of the amount of cells, right? Hypertrophy would be an enlargement of the cells, so hyperplasia. So this is uh, implying that we have some kind of growth, um, probably a neoplasm in this prostate gland, but it's, not, it's benign and not malignant, okay? So A, there is a malignant tumor in your father's prostate. Not true. Your father's prostate is currently shrinking and may not be functional. Well, hyperplasia is increasing the number of cells. What would shrinking? That would be atrophy, right? Okay, so uh, your father's prostate is increasing in size, but there is no concern for cancer at this moment. That would be your best choice, right? At this moment, we don't know, but we need to keep an eye on it to see what happens to it. Two of the above, none of the above, right? Um, and those don't fit here. Okay, good. So that's a good test question example that I wanted to throw out there. And just to reinforce why you should, when you're studying these terms, don't just memorize, look up, look up some situations, apply it.
All right, now let's talk about more epithelial tissue. We have two main types of epithelial tissue. Covering and lining, so we can categorize it as covering and lining, and these we find on the external and internal surfaces, and glandular epithelial tissue. So these are secretory, and they're gonna produce some kind of substance. Now I mentioned this a little bit earlier, a couple slides ago, but the polarity of cells, so we can see our apical plasma membrane up here, and what is the apical portion of those cells doing? Well, generally, it's regulating what's coming in and out of it. It's exposed to some kind of external environment with epithelial tissue, right? We're covering and lining. So down here is our basement membrane, which means there would be connective tissue in an internal environment here. This would be our external environment, either the opening of our mouth or the opening of the vagina or um, the, the outer portions of our skin that are covering and exposed to the external environment. So these components or this part of the cell is kind of regulating what's coming in and out and it's protecting us from the external environment. On the lateral portions, we are coming in contact with other cells. We're holding together with those cells. If you've ever played Red Rover, Red Rover, right? Uh, you link arms and people are trying to run through you and you know they're looking for the weakest link, but you know, you're trying to hold on really tight. And uh, you know, this is kind of what these cells are doing is, is holding on and not letting anything get through. And then down here at our basal region, this is where we're connecting into uh, our basement membrane. We're holding it on really tight. And we're also uh, working on creating uh, ion gradients here, all right? Now, uh, you learned about this in lab, so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but when we talk about simple or stratified, simple is one single layer of cells and stratified is multiple layers of cells named after their apical surface, okay? So we find where that basement membrane is, it should stand out to you in histology, and um, then we look at the top and see what is that shape of, of cells there. Now, uh, the three different types we've talked about, squamous, so tile, thin, squished, cube-like, or columnar, tall and column shaped. So make sure that you kind of have a good idea of their functionality. Thin, flat cells are really great for diffusion because things can move across their, uh, their cell really, really quickly. Whereas cube shape, again, they're gonna absorb, uh, but they're also gonna secrete. And so we'll see a lot of simple cuboidal cells involved with uh, the endocrine system. And columnar shaped, uh, these again, they also secrete and absorb um, as, we, as we'll see as we keep moving. So always ask yourself, how many layers? And then what's the shape of the cell? How many layers, shape of the cell? So practice a little bit. I've got a few slides here. Pause the video, tell me what you think. What do we have? I, mean, I feel like I need some like, you know, theme music here. Okay, hopefully you said simple cuboidal. We can see our basement membrane down here. We see this hollow empty space in here. Uh, and so then we can find that our, our uh, basement membrane is down and around here and we see a single layer of cells. We see a nucleus in here. Uh, and so we can say, all right, those kind of look cube shaped. How about here? All right, if you said pseudo-stratified, you are correct. Remember, we've got these tall column-shaped cells. We can see a different type of cell down in here, right? This looks more like connective tissue, which means that we have a nice little basement membrane kind of along this line right over here, okay? We see these tall column-shaped cells, and remember, each of these cells connects with the basement membrane. And we see a layer of nuclei here, and we see another layer of nuclei here, which kind of leads us to think that it's stratified, but we don't see those cell membranes, really uh, distinguished cell membranes along this, uh, uh, these cell surfaces here. What we also see are these nice tall cilia, okay, up at the top, and we can also identify goblet cells. And so we know that goblet cells exist within simple columnar and 
pseudo stratified and so at that point you can make a logical decision and say all right well i know they're tall i see multiple nuclei uh, could be stratified could be could be that pseudo stratified oh uh, man i don't know uh, but we then see this on the cell surface so that should lead us to believe okay maybe that's cilia or maybe that's microvilli and you know we've only really talked about simple columnar and pseudo stratified and we see goblet cells these big empty clear looking cells here uh, that are going to produce mucus so again that should imply and really reinforce that it's columnar and pseudo stratified and then we can come back to the nuclei and say well if it was columnar, I would only see one layer of nuclei. This has got to be pseudostratified. So practice on thinking your way through it. Use those observations. Use your observation skills to see these types of differences. And it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of work. So go over it and over it and over it. And the more you can uh, look at slides in an open lab or online, the better you're going to do in your lab and lecture exams. How about this one? Okay, hopefully you said stratified squamous. So down here we can see, I'm gonna back this up, we can see that we've got different cell types down here. We've got this yellow, or sorry, this red, I don't know where that came from, this red sort of like fibrous looking tissue. Then we can see this nice line right along here if we follow that up and around and down the other side this is our basement membrane now we see lots of cells above that and we see some empty space up here which is implying that there's some kind of external environment or maybe a cavity that we're lining so that means these are our basal cells and up here would be our apical cells and so now we're going to name these cells based off of our apical cells which if we look closely are sort of flat and squished and thin. So this is gonna be a stratified squamous. Now, one thing to note, look at this cell. There's no nucleus, no nucleus, no nucleus. But the ones above it have it. These ones don't have a nucleus. These ones have it, these ones have it. Remember, you're taking a cross section through these cells and you might take a cross section if the nucleus is here and I take a cross section in front of it, my cross section isn't going to show that there's a nucleus. But what we can infer or imply from this is that because we're seeing nuclei up and around and kind of scattered throughout all of the layers, that all of these cells should be living. Okay, if we saw no nuclei up in this layer up here, then we can imply that those cells are likely dead. Okay, so keep that in mind because that's going to be important when we talk about keratinized or non-keratinized epithelial tissue. So let's look at each of these types of cells, uh, or sorry, these tissues, and let's go over the identifying, the location, and the function. Simple squamous cells, single row, flat, squishy cells, they are involved in rapid diffusion. Thin cells, we want substances moving across them. So in this image, we have the cross section of lung tissue. And so we have these big air spaces. When you inhale, that's filled up with air and oxygen is gonna diffuse into these tissues and capillaries and CO2 is gonna diffuse out and then you're going to compress your lungs and force that air out. Well, we find that in our lungs, as I just mentioned, but also around our, uh, in the inside of our heart, so in our endothelial layer, um, our endocardium, and then on the inner linings of blood vessels. Simple cuboidal cells. Uh, again, we saw an example of that, so we can see that basement membrane there. Single row cube-like cells. Uh, they are involved in an absorption and secretion, so making hormones, making sweat, making oil, and so these uh, will be producing those generally into these tubules that we see here. Okay, um, And these we find in kidney tubules, uh, glands, in our liver, uh, all over our body. So they're very, um, very prevalent. There's a great image of a simple columnar cells. 
Uh, here's another nice image over here. I believe you've probably seen this in labs, but you can see these really great, highly distinguished goblet cells that are clear and filled with mucus. Um, and we can see that single uh, columnar cell. We can see the connective tissue layer below it and our basement membrane right over here. Uh, so single row of tall, narrow cells. Uh, they secrete mucus. Um, they're also involved in absorption because they're going to have microvilli on there. Uh, and I think we can kind of see some of those microvilli right in here. Um, and we find them from the stomach all the way down to our intestines. All right. Now you'll also notice I put these four blooms down here, these taxonomic layers. Um, you've probably been seeing these pop up and I keep meaning to just kind of reference them, but I'll do it here. So what should you be doing with these kinds of, of slides? Well, you definitely need to memorize these slides. Okay, you've got to get the terminology down, but you also have to understand how this works. So when you're thinking about the location, stomach to intestines, we need mucus that's being produced so that our stomach isn't digesting itself or digesting itself as rapidly. And we need uh, microvilli for absorption of nutrients in the intestines. So kind of understanding how these work and then applying it to different parts of the body. And, and uh, when we say, well, what kind of tissue is going to be found in you know, the, uh, the large intestine or the esophagus or you know, whatever part of the body, you can now sort of apply your understanding of these tissues and then you can analyze them. When we give you an image on a test in lab or in lecture, you can look at that and sort of dissect it and try to figure out what is this thing and do you have any knowledge? Well, if it's in the stomach, what does that mean that, uh, for its functionality? Okay, so that's why those are down there. All right, now I love this connection here. So uh, this ties in, again, we're in the lumen of the small intestine. So we've talked about fiber and osmosis. Then we looked at the, the parietal and, uh, cells of our stomach, and we talked about uh, the four types of transportation, simple diffusion and uh, primary and secondary active transport and facilitated diffusion uh, across those cells with that animation that we had of all those ions, right? Now here, what I wanted to just point out is that again, over here on this side, we have a villus. So one of those big finger-like projections sticking up and that's covered in uh, a simple columnar epithelial tissue, which we have uh, microvilli. So again, on the inside here of our small intestine, we have our food that's coming through. Chyme is what it's called at that point. It's this chemically mush mashed baby food like substance that's being propelled through our intestine. It's full of nutrients. So those nutrients need to pass through our cells and go into our blood vessels that are over here in the villus. And so I really like how this image kind of just shows us the importance of tight junctions because we want those nutrients to pass through the cell instead of between the cell. We can see that that does actually happen. Some water does migrate through those tight junctions, okay? But we limit the movement of water and glucose through those tight junctions and force that to go over here through those cells. Those cells are better at regulating things, right? It's kind of like, um, you've got guards and you want the guards to pass through the gate and there's always somebody that's going to try to jump over the gate to get into the castle right but um you know the, that tends to be a little bit limited and we just kind of regulate things moving through but again here notice we have uh, a sim port so we've got some substances moving in we've got a probably a um, uh, we've got our carrier mediated diffusion molecule here, bringing uh, fructose in, uh, fructose, glucose, galactose, all these are going to migrate through and then they're going to be transported out into uh, our blood vessels over here into our capillaries and our good old sodium potassium pump over here, right? Working away, keeping, regulating our ion concentration, regulating our fluid volume. So again, all of this is happening uh, when we talk about these different types of tissues. So I, I really like this diagram because it, it puts together a lot of the topics that we're talking about into a, a bigger picture for you. Okay, moving on, 
We've got pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. This is a great image over here. We can see those cilia. Uh, remember microtubules in those cilia are gonna beat and wave and try to move particulates away from our lungs. It looks stratified, but it's not. It helps uh, secrete mucus and trap dust, moves things away from our lungs, and remember the difference between cilia and microvilli. And we find that in our respiratory passages. Uh, great. Next, we have stratified squamous, so it's multi-layered. We've got our basement membrane, we've got underlying connective tissue. We name it for those apical cells at the top. It's helping to retard the water loss uh, that would just naturally happen. Um, so um, just like plants evapotranspirate, uh, humans are losing water, and this uh, uh, stratified squamous reduces the amount of water that's being lost. Um, it also prevents abrasion, uh, so if you get scuffed up a little bit, it's keeping uh, bacteria and pathogens out. It's our, our suit of armor, if you will, and that's going to form our epidermal layer. And then one of the trickiest ones is transitional epithelial tissue. Uh, we find this in our bladder and our ureters. Uh, it kind of, to me, looks like frog eggs. Um, another TA that we have in the labs last year, um, so she kind of looks at it as like um, caviar on crackers. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I don't eat caviar, I'm not that fancy, or you know, I don't have the money to buy caviar. Um, if I did, I don't know if I would, but um, I think there's a lot of other environmental reasons why to not do that. But anyways, we've got our uh, basement membrane down here, and we've got sort of these circular eggs that can stretch um, and when they stretch they look more stratified and when they relax they look more circular or cube like this is the the probably the one of the trickiest ones in labs that most people always miss so I'll practice this one a lot now there are some rare tissues just a couple more and we'll be done for this lecture here stratified cuboidal cells we do see those around uh, the, the egg in um, female. So the graphian follicle, you'll learn about primary and secondary and tertiary follicles. And so we do have stratified cuboidal cells. These cells are making hormones. Um, and so we find those uh, up throughout the body, but they're not super prevalent. Uh, we do also find stratified columnar cells. We tend to find these in, in different ducts. So the parotid gland duct, um, part of the male urethra as well. So, um, but again, less, less important than the other ones. Um, if you were to focus on memorizing tissues and you were like, man, I just, I just don't have room to know about stratified columnar and cuboidal, it's probably less likely that you're gonna have questions on a test about it. You might have one, whereas the other uh, epithelial tissues are much more um, useful for us and much more common because we talk about it in lab and lecture a lot. So spend your energy studying those. Okay, last couple of bits of information. So we talked about our covering and lining epithelial tissue. Now I just want to quickly touch on our glandular epithelial tissue. So glandular epithelial tissue, um, a gland is, is one or more cells that is making uh, some type of fluid. So endocrine glands, just as a refresher, ductless, endo inside. So they're releasing their substances into the blood or into our lymph. So you can see here that uh, we're generally secreting hormones in our endocrine system here, uh, we, or we are secreting hormones into our uh, endocrine system through the lymph or blood, and those have some type of target. So a target tissue or a target cell, a target organ, they're gonna go somewhere into the body. Uh, when we talk about exocrine glands, though, they're much more prevalent than our endocrine glands, and they're secreting products through those ducts, okay? Uh, they're going onto a body surface or into a body cavity. So you can see some examples listed here. Uh, mucus, um, we have merocrine glands, we'll learn about those. We have sebaceous glands, so they're going to produce sebum. You've probably learned about those in lab, in your integumentary system lab. Mammary glands, they're gonna make milk. We have serous, uh, serous glands that are producing serous fluid and salivary glands.
And we can break those into unicellular, so our goblet cells that we see within simple columnar and pseudostratified are single-celled glands that exist within our, our tissue. Pretty cool, right? Um, and so they're secreting their mucus to the surface of whatever structure they're lining. Our multicellular exocrine glands then um, generally have a big duct. They have a secretory unit. There's all kinds of classifications on their shapes, um, but we're not going to get into that. So we've made it, and we, are, we have compared structure, function, location of all of our epithelial tissues and our glandular tissue. Way to hang in there. Nice job. I'll see you next lecture when we start going over the connective tissues, and then after that we'll hit muscle and nervous tissue. Have a great afternoon.